So what we're going to talk about real quick is um, the world and where Cleveland fits and economic and demographic indicators that kind of chart that progress. But before we do that, um, before I got into economics, I was a clinical psychology major. So I got my graduate degree in clinical psychology. I um, focused on social psychology. And so everything I do is I marry psychology with economic development. It's psychology with policy and how it ends up in economic development. And there's a, there's a, a term me and Jim coined called Rust Belt Shame. And it's a collective psychology that really came with deindustrialization. The city's all about networks. Globalization's all about networks. What we, what we do in Cleveland is we build up walls and we become very parochial. We become balkanized. So that's a lot of the work that me and Jim do. We, we want to debalkanize the region for economic restructuring. So I'm going to turn this next... So just one row. So when I talk to people, I say, just think of the city as like a fish tank. Think of your business like a fish tank. Um, think of your person as a fish tank. If you cut off circulation, what happens? The system becomes inert. And Cleveland is sixth worst in the nation in birthplace diversity. Birthplace diversity is the percentage of people who live in your city who are born in that state. So 75% of Clevelanders are born in Ohio. Sixth worst in the nation. So one real thing. So what we do is we try to everyone to get keep calm. Just keep calm. Don't freak out. Existential woe is us. It's okay. We have a lot of assets here. Study the numbers. Get good policy. Keep calm and study macroeconomics. And that's what we do. We start macro and see how it ends up micro. So part of the work that I've done in particular is look at uh, how economic eras change and how they impact demographics. And so here you can see the rise of manufacturing, and of course, with that comes the rise of population. And I think it's important to understand that our obsession with population numbers is tied to the manufacturing era. So it did actually make a lot of sense that if you were booming in people, you were booming in manufacturing. And so we became used to this. So, so manufacturing and population, you know, that, those, that's a good marriage. But for other economic eras that come after that, it is not a very good metric. It's actually a very poor metric. And in fact, some, in some cases, population decline is a positive economic indicator. And you're seeing the spread of demographic decline across the world. You have over three billion people in countries that are in demographic decline, meaning the birth rate uh, isn't high enough to make up for the people who are dying. So, mo and most of those countries are wealthy countries and well-educated countries. Well-educated, wealthy people have less children. And so, when you're seeing demographic decline, you're looking at economic restructuring. That's leading to the population decline, but you're seeing more and more people have degrees. The peak of Pittsburgh's manufacturing era was 1910. And it's been, the manufacturing has been in decline ever since. And they're deleveraging in terms of the percentage of the workforce involved in employment. And some might say that's a bad thing, but for more, you know, what we're here to tell you is that it's a very good thing. And you can see that Cleveland's a little bit later, uh, but all, you know, note that Cleveland, Boston, and Pittsburgh, all three places went through the same process. So forget the Rust Belt shame part of it. It's not that Cleveland did something wrong. It's not that Pittsburgh did something wrong. And it's certainly not that Boston did something wrong. They all went through the same process. Different policies, different governance, doesn't matter. Same, same kind of data churn, same kind of trajectory. All right, so uh, what we're looking at here is just trying to get a national picture. And again, kind of disaggregating what the labor market looks like. And uh, you know, an understanding of, like, say, like healthcare and higher education, uh, in this case, we'll just talk about healthcare because that's what relates most to Cleveland is uh, most people were skeptical that it could be, like you say, a driver of regional economic growth. Healthcare services tends to be locally oriented uh, and cost concerns are a big deal. So how could, how could healthcare be driving the kind of numbers we're talking about? Well, in, in this case, uh, you've got two places that have high employment specialization and share. Right, so share meaning you know how many people are involved in the region in the workforce in healthcare, and so you've got basically two places in the United States standing out. 
Boston, which I'm sure if he said healthcare, biotech, life sciences, you're on board. Uh, right on par, Cleveland. Nowhere else in the United States. And so when you get this, it's, it's, it's divergent. Right? So you've got healthcare everywhere. And the everywhere healthcare, it's got to be cheap. Right? That kind of healthcare delivery. But when you have this kind of clustering going on, you can pay higher salaries. You can hoover up all the talent because you have this kind of uh, uh, specialization that allows you to charge more. So you know, we were trying to figure out what this emerging geography, economic geography, looks like. And so you can think about, well, it made sense where manufacturing was located. You had transport networks, you had raw materials, and you had labor. All these things converged to make Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Detroit, great epicenters of, of global commerce. Well, now you're seeing very, very different things, but it's basically the same economic geography. It's the legacy assets from the great titans of industry that are forming this new economy. So it's happening basically in the same places that did it best. And, and so what's happening, what's indicative of that is you have a company like Phillips moving from Silicon Valley to Cleveland. Why to Cleveland? Well, the key is, is the knowledge being produced here is done in these open kind of networks like at universities so they can collaborate with other people around the world. And it's very good for, for knowledge production. Whereas industry has to be secretive. They have to protect intellectual property. They have to protect their investment. And so there's a lot of R&D that can be done at a university that cannot be done in industry. So we've got 75% of R&D in the United States today is done at universities. So what's going on in Pittsburgh? Again, Pittsburgh's a little bit ahead. Um, but this is what this is not Rust Belt change. This is not managing the client. This is what um, Pittsburgh's mayor said to Governing recently, Governing Magazine. I never thought that I would live in a city that would be a boom town. I always thought it would be how well we manage the client. So when I meet with Mayor Jackson, when I meet with Buttigieg, uh, when I meet with leaders, I say, don't manage the client because if you manage the client, what are you going to get? You're going to get the client. Be visionary and plan for growth. Know where your growth is coming, be on the cusp of it, and plan accordingly. And we're trying to get people to kind of think about it. So last slide, um, this is an excerpt from Metals and Mines. The stakes for Cleveland in such a scenario cannot be overemphasized. If the city indeed becomes an outpost of longevity, then Cleveland's more recent landscape of loss will be no more alive in the memory of its manufacturing prowess. But this is not inevitable. Collective understanding is needed to ensure this vision becomes reality. Thank you.